So I want to do another extra lecture this Friday. If you don't, I only want to do those work problems and do examples so that make sure everybody is uh, doing well in the class. So I don't plan on covering new material. So uh, the point of that is uh, I want to, if there's any holes in what you're missing, I want to make sure you have the opportunity to ask me to work problems like in circuits or MOSFET operation or whatever. So you can come in and ask me to do things. I'll, again, I'm trying not to... Uh, cover new stuff so uh, I I'm sure I was gonna have to make a trip next week but that got cancelled but I'm sure I'll have to make a trip sooner or later later I want to be ahead of the game I know what you're thinking he's given me more than my money's worth man we all have two lectures now and we haven't missed any we're two extra ones what's up with that stop giving me my money's worth Well, I'll record it so you can uh, go to the other one. Is your other professor recording it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know what to tell you. Um, well, wait, wait a sec. Here's from my point of view. I'm trying to make sure that you don't get cheated out of your education, that you have opportunities to fill in holes. I'm trying to do everything and give my time, so don't complain, okay? <laughs> What's that? I don't, there's nothing I can do about anybody else, you know? All it does is, oh no, you're wrong, I'm great, just ask me. That's all I get, all right? <laughs> I don't know what to say. Okay, you're great. All right, so notice the grading here. Did anybody look at the grades in the last couple hours? So what I did was I'm starting to put the uh, scores over here, and you can quickly see my comment at the beginning of the semester was what percentage almost regularly doesn't make it with a C or better in my class? 30%. Now, this is... 25%, we've probably covered, of the total, we've probably covered 5%. This is 25, 25, 25, so this grade is representative of only 5% of your overall grade. So generally, I don't put it here, but I, I think there needs to be some motivation, especially in my 320 class, to uh, make sure that you don't miss quizzes and homeworks and all that stuff. Any questions? Any questions about Friday? If you can make it, great. If you don't have any problems, then that's fine too. Just out of curiosity. <sighs> Fold it in half. Name over here. <sighs> All right. Are you random Yogi Nagawa? Nagawa, come and get your homework. All right, so you sit here, and I don't know, I can't be any clearer, I don't pass everybody. I don't know what more to say, okay, so I won't say any more. Um, we have, this is the homework due on Wednesday, February 16th, question. No, John. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and you're talking too, that's double makes me mad. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he was not. I was focused on you, man. Talking and eating. <laughs> All right. So February 16th is what? Yeah, Washington's birthday. So we won't have class on February 16th. So uh, keep that in mind. All right. Um, all right. I think everything's clear. Okay. Now you too. All uh, right. There. All right, are there any questions on uh, the direction or anything in the class? Anybody complaining they're getting too much for their money? <laughs> All right, so we're going to today talk about uh, devices for analog design, temperature effects, and all that. Before I do that, are there any questions? 
keeping in mind Friday, you can bring in any problems you want uh, to be answered, to fill in any knowledge. I mean, within reason, I'm not going to work power systems questions or something unrelated to the class. Okay. So let's go and uh, get going. Yes, lay it on me. Yeah, the voltage, remember, it's in chapter 6. We went over it briefly last time, that when you have a potential of the body, the body's at a lower potential than the source for the NMOS. Where is it? <clears throat> that your body steals charge. So when you, this potential's lower than the source, you basically, this you can think of this as a voltage that steals charge from under the channel. The effect is that you have to apply a larger gate source voltage to invert the channel, so your threshold voltage goes up. And that's called the body effect. Now, you can imagine that if we wiggle this, if we do a, uh, if we wiggle the source to bolt voltage back and forth, we're also going to have a body transconductance, which I'm sure you all read about in Chapter 9 because you're reading the book. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to write the overall model for the uh, um, for the MOSFET, and so I want to use the capacitances, the basic capacitances. So between the gate and the source, and this is for saturation. This is two thirds C ox prime times W times L, and I label this terminal what. gate. And I come down here, I'll call that source. Then I'll come over here. And I call this what? GM what? GM VGS. And then what's this voltage? VGS. And then I'm going to add something else right here between the drain and the source. What is it? R out. And then one last capacitance, which is between the gate and the source, and that's CG, uh, I'm sorry, gate and drain, that's CGD, which is CGDO times W. And if you recall, I have a capacitance here like this, which is CGD, and I have a capacitance here, which is CGS. Any questions on that small signal model? Alright, so I'm going to use this and we're going to get some parameters that are very important for the class. And this is going to be, and you're going to ask me, well, how do I select W? How do I select L? You know, how do I uh, select the device sizes for particular performance, etc.? And this, we're going to use this model to answer those questions, okay? So let's go and first let's ask, how do I design for the fastest speed? So what that means is I want to look at the MOSFET so that it's the MOSFETs inherently limiting the speed of the circuit. So I'm not going to put like a big resistor in here that forms an RC time constant that slows things down. Okay, what I want to do is just inherently how fast can the MOSFET go if it has to charge and discharge its own capacitances. Okay, so everybody follow that. Okay, so we're going to... We're going to present a figure of merit called the FT, or transition frequency. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the MOSFET, I'm going to bias it in saturation. So I'm going to put a voltage source here, VGS. I'm going to go over to the gate, connect the source to ground. Now I'm going to bias. Now keep in mind everything's about biasing. I got to bias it so the transistor's on. I'm going to put a VDS there. Then in order to get a current to flow, I'm going to apply an AC VGS. And I'm going to write that this current here is ID plus little ID. And what is that current then? Right, GM VGS. 
Okay? Any questions? Okay, so what can I say about VDS relative to VGS for this to be in saturation? I sound like a broken record here. It has to be greater than the threshold voltage. I have to make sure. And then what can I say about VGS for this device to be in saturation in terms of the threshold voltage? VGS has to be greater than the threshold. You know, I don't think deep on this. I say, okay, I got to turn the device on. Okay, I got to apply a pressure to the device. And I use these equations over and over again. It's not because I have a good memory. It's I'm using them repeatedly. Any questions? Okay. If I ask you, what is the AC voltage there? What is VDS equal to? What's the zero? I can't change the voltage. I got a voltage source that says, hey, I'm holding that potential at VDS. It's never going to change. So the AC voltage there is zero. I have no resistances in this circuit that are slowing down the operation. Does everybody follow? Okay, now here's something that's not going to make a lot of sense. But I'm going to say that I also have a gate current. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But you could argue, wait a sec, MOSFETs don't have gate current. There's a piece of polysilicon that's sitting over glass. How can I get current flowing in that piece of polysilicon? It's a displacement current. And that's a term you should understand. Displacement current means you're redistributing charge on each side of the capacitor. There's no actual physical charge transfer, but it appears there is. It's not a, a conduction current. It's a displacement current. You're displacing charge, and it makes it appear that there's a current flowing. So it only works for AC. So we need to calculate IG. And then we need to calculate ID, which is easy. It's GMVGS. It's the VGS I apply here. And then that ratio, ID to IG, when that's equal to 1, whenever the drain current is equal to the gate current, at that frequency, that's my transition frequency. Does everybody follow? OK, so I look at that and I say, all right. Um, well, let me ask a simpler question. What's the AC voltage right there? Yeah, it's the AC VGS. What's the AC voltage drop across the DC source? Zero. So if I were to put a big capacitor like this, how would it influence my circuit? It wouldn't do anything. Just be a holding a voltage across that voltage source. It doesn't influence the circuit at all. You don't believe me? You can simulate it and see. Still says VGS. It helps VGS actually go through if there was some finite resistance in that source. Any questions? OK, so I want you to take a mental picture of this circuit. And I'm going to draw it with the small signal circuit, and then we're going to derive this. And then once we derive it, it's going to tell us how do we select VGS for high speed? How do we select W and L for high speed? How does the mobility come into play? It tells us what we need to do to design circuits that are fast or slow or low power. <clears throat> so now I'm thinking, hey, you know, you could teach the class at 4 o'clock instead of at 1 o'clock, you know, and then I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then it'll be somebody's, well, I can make 1 o'clock, but I can't make 4 o'clock. Oh, brother. All right. So anyway, I'm going to draw the AC circuit. So for AC circuit, do I have the DC sources there? No. So I've got a VGS, and then shunting the VGS are in parallels, another name for shunting. I've got CGS, which is two thirds C aux. Oh, what's C aux prime? Refresh my memory. Epsilon aux over T aux. All right, and I've got a CGD which is the overlap capacitance, times W. Then I have a GM VGS. And then how are my source and drain connected together? So my source is here. My drain is here. In my small signal circuit, how are they connected? All right, well, let's draw our O. 
let's be complete. But that says, hey, I got an R out. That's what I don't want. What's the AC voltage there? What's the AC voltage there? Okay, well, aren't these connected together? I just am lazy not drawing the wire between them. So what's the voltage drop AC across there? So what do I replace a DC voltage source with? A wire. So I go, oh, okay, I got that. That's where my DC source used to be. Any questions? Now I got that Katy Perry song stuck in my head. I'm going to start going doot, 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 doot. <laughs> All right. What's the voltage here? VGS. All right. What's the voltage here? Okay. So let's see. This I called the current IG. Let me see. IG goes into the gate and it goes into this cat capacitor and this one and they're in parallel because this is AC ground. So would everybody be cool if I wrote and this voltage I just said was VGS right there. These are both in parallel to AC ground so would everybody be cool, cool if I said IG is VGS divided by 1 over J omega times the sum of these. So I'll write that. IG is equal to VGS all over 1 divided by J times omega CGD plus CGS. It's just Ohm's law. Voltage divided by current, or um, voltage divided by impedance is current. <clears throat> okay, so if I ask, wait, let me pause because sometimes people say I go too fast. Pause. <laughs> Okay, what's ID? Yeah, v GM VGS. How much current? Where's ID flow? Well, it flows like this. That's this current. Well, wait a sec. How come none of this current's flowing through here or here? Why is, what's up with that? Yeah, it's shorted. The current source is shorted. All of that current's going to flow through the short. We're going, we're going to get an exciting example. We're almost there. So ID all over IG is equal to, let's be verbose, because this is one of my favorite test and quiz questions. Show how to determine the FT of a transistor. Is VGS... And would everybody be okay if I wrote this as J omega times CGD plus CGS? Just flip this up on top with the VGS. Okay. Okay. The VGS is cancel. And I get ID over IG is equal to GM divided by 2 pi F times CGD plus C G S. <clears throat> okay, so let me pause and ask, okay, at DC, what is the gate current? Zero. So what would be my current gain at DC if the gate current's zero? Infinite. Does this equation show me that I have infinite gain at DC when F is at DC when F is zero? Yeah, so if I were to pause and ask you plot FT versus frequency for a MOSFET, you would do the following. And it would just keep going up for every increase in 10 or every increase or for every time we go decrease in 10 by frequency a decade, we go up in 10 or 20 dB by current gain. So everybody, this is where I cringe. I'm assuming everybody knows that. So this slope is what? Yeah, minus 20 dB per decade. If this doesn't, if you don't know this, go back and watch this semester's 320 lectures because I went through this backwards and forwards so they would know what 
14 dB is. What's 14 dB? See, now I'm wondering, what's the point? My 320 students don't remember, and it's only been a year. What's 6 dB? 2. Yeah, what's 14 dB? 5. 20 dB. 10. What's a decade below 1.2 kilohertz? 120. It's just there. you want to use decades, octaves 2, decades 10, 6 dB is 2, 20 dB is 10, 14 dB is 5, because it's super, super simple. Here, if I go down in frequency by 10, my gain goes up by 10. 20 dB per decade. Okay, watch those videos if that doesn't ring a bell. All right, so I care about this frequency right here, which is FT, which is where the current gain is 0 dB. All right, so tell me, how do I, what is ID over IG at this frequency? Does everybody recall? Agree with that? So if I were to use this result, how do I modify this equation? Yeah, I set ID over, I take the magnitude, oops, I left out the J here. I take the magnitude, which is just GM over 2 pi F, CGD plus CGS, change this to FT, set this equal to 1, and solve for FT, and I get this outstanding result. FT is equal to GM over 2 pi times CGD plus CGS. Where'd the F go to? What's that? Yeah. 1, and I just slid that bead up there, FT is equal to GM. And then we're going to pause and look at this. Any questions on how I derive that? This is like, okay, you get a job and you have to design a chip, and you, okay, how do I select my device sizes? Because I've been through here, I'm like, okay, how do I start out and select W and L? How do I select VGS? Okay, this is, you're going to know how to do it after looking at this equation, at least for speed. So I write this as FT equals GM divided by 2 pi times CGS plus CGD. Okay. So I'm going to replace a few things here. I'm going to rewrite GM as, uh, let's write it like this mu n c ox times w over l times vgs minus v threshold n. I'm going to divide that by 2 pi times cgs or times c ox which is uh, or cgs which is uh, 2 thirds and what's c ox prime? Yeah, epsilon ox over T ox, I'll just leave it as C ox prime, times W times L. And then the overlap capacitance, what can I say about CG, CGS relative to CGD? Okay, so recall, well, I don't know, hopefully you recall, from MOSFET and saturation, if this is the source and this is the gate, I get a CGS which is due to that channel. Okay? For the CGD, I get a little bit of overlap, which is just the overlap of the drain going underneath. And if you don't recall that, go review your MOSFET capacitance. So what can I say about CGS and CGD? Yeah, CGS is much, much bigger than CGD, so I'm going to change this to approximate and just leave it like that so I can get a good result, something useful. Okay, so tell me something you notice here. W's cancel. Okay, so I want to intuitively explain that. If I make my device wider, what happens to the capacitance as I make it bigger by increasing the width? Capacitances go up. Got bigger areas, right? What happens to the GM if I make my W bigger with everything else being the same? It goes up as well. So I have a bigger capacitance, but I have a bigger transconductance to drive the capacitance. 
so they cancel. So when I go to design, the W is selected based upon how much current I need to supply. Like if I'm driving a capacitive load, I might say, OK, I got a capacitive load of C. I need a current I, and I want to change or charge that with some DV and some DT, which is the change in voltage over time. And that I, we'll talk about this more later if you're not getting it, that I is going to be how I select my W. But for speed, the W doesn't come into play. Inherent speed, I should say. Not dependent on W. Is that clear? Okay, but what about L? Ah, so if I want the fastest circuits, what do I want to use for the L? Yeah, FT goes up. As L goes down, and I want to use the smallest L possible for high speed. So everybody follow that. Okay, so traditionally, if you remember, maybe not many of you do, but back in like the early 90s, they were having the 386 and the 486 computers, and they were in like 2 micron technology. And then there was like a tremendous increase in computer speed because every time they would go to a new generation, the speed would go up as the square of the length. So you would reduce the length by half and your speed would go up by four. So everything was just shooting through the roof. Well, in these modern transistors, the mobility is starting to saturate. And so instead of getting a linear change in the current or GM with L, it kind of flattens out and you get more of an L increase. So as they reduce the the, if, as they have, for example, the uh, length in the modern process is the speed only doubles. So the last decade or so, the speed hasn't been continuing to shoot up. It's only doubling. So that's why when they go to smaller processes, you get faster speed. Any questions? So here's the takeaway. If you're going to design a fast analog circuit, you need to get as much speed out of that process as possible. There's no deep thought. You've got to use minimum L. The problem with using minimum L, there are several problems. One is the output resistance is bad, so you don't get as much gain, and we'll talk about that eh, hopefully later today. The other issue is that uh, you uh, don't get good matching, meaning you have two transistors. Their electrical characteristics don't track. So when we do current mirrors, like we talked about a little bit in like the diff amp, for example, in example 9.5, the transistors don't have identical characteristics. There's this law called Moore's law that says that every 18 months, the number of transistors is going to double on a chip. Well, the thing that ultimately may kill Moore's law is that you can't manufacture two transistors identically, and so your manufacturing variability is so bad that the chips start to fail. Okay, this transistor's got a high threshold. This one's got a low threshold, so it leaks a lot, and you just can't make them because they're so tiny. Uh, that they match each other. All right, the other key point here is what? What's the other takeaway from this? <clears throat> this equation right here. What is VGS? How does the VGS influence FT? Yeah, VGS goes up. What happens to my FT? it goes up. So if I want high speed, I got to use the largest VGS possible. Now let me just point this out because we're going to use this over and over again. So I'm going to give you lots of names for the same thing because that's the way the literature is. Okay, Based upon what we learned at the beginning of the lecture, what's the name for VGS minus V threshold N? Yeah, VDS sat. That's the value where the transistor starts to go into saturation. So if I use a bigger VGS, what's the drawback? Yeah, I can't keep my device in saturation as big, as wide a range. I, once I hit VDS, it's this. Instead of this, it, it goes into triode. In other words, if I look at low VDS sat, I might get something like this. So I can go all the way down here, roughly, before my device triodes. If I use a large VGS, I'll get something like this. Well, now VDS sat, whoops, 
VDS sat is way out here. So I can't have circuits that swing as wide because they start to try out and the gain drops. So I have a trade-off. If I want high speed, I need to lose, use large VDS sat. But if I use large VDS sat, I don't get large output swing. So everybody follow that. Now, let me just tell you why that's a big deal. In these smaller processes, they've reduced the power supply voltage. So you know, you go, it's 5 volts before 20 years ago. Then there was a 3.3 for a long time. And there's still stuff operating at 3.3. Then it went to 1.8. Now a lot of stuff is like 1.2 and 1 volt. Well, the problem with that is just say you want to listen to music. And you only can drive a volt into a speaker versus 5 volts. Well, now you can't listen to music loud. And if you're like me and you like loud music, then that's a problem. Okay, so I don't want to have circuits that can only swing like this. I want them to swing, you know, large amounts. So everybody follow. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple more names for that exact same term, the VDS sat. One of a, another one is overdrive. We talked about that last time. This is called the overdrive voltage or overdrive in, and it's the amount of voltage in excess of the threshold voltage. So in example 9.5, we calculated the VGS as 1.05 volts. The threshold was 0.8, so the overdrive was 0.25. So if I increase the overdrive, which is the same as saying increase VDS sat, I get faster circuits. So I could write FT is proportional to 1 over L squared. FT is proportional to V overdrive. We'll use this over and over again. When we say, OK, this is a general analog design. How do I select V overdrive? I'll say set a good starting point is 5% of VDD. So if VDD is 5 volts, we'll put our overdrive at 250. So if the overdrive is 250, the threshold voltage is uh, um, 0.8. What's VGS? 1.05. It's what we had in the example 9.5. But you see how we're talking about the same thing, and it's getting confusing because we're using the same name for different, for, I mean, same uh, different name for the same thing. Because I'm going to confuse you a little bit more. So example 9.5, what was the overdrive voltage for the NMOS? 250 millivolts. What was the VGS of the NMOS? 1.05. What was the VDS sat of the NMOS? 250 millivolts. How are VDS sat and V overdrive related? They're the same. Now, when we get into the nanometer devices, it starts to get a little bit fuzzy to use these equations because they're so complicated. They don't say, oh, it's in saturation, oh, it's in triode. It's like it changes you know, by an order of 10 between one point and another. So it's not like here's this demarcation. OK, here's the border, saturation, triode. And that students have a hard time getting because they do their homework, look at it and go, oh, I calculated a mega ohm and spice gives me 2.5 mega ohms. Then I'll say, OK, change the VDS so it's bigger. Oh, now spice gives me 5 meg. Okay, it's a real device. You're doing real design. You're not doing academic stuff with simple equations. Any questions? <coughs> All right. In hindsight, I think today should have been the day I started to wear shorts and sandals. <laughs> I was telling myself, Friday, it's supposed to be 80. That'll be the day. Okay. Um, all right, so one other comment here. Notice that the mobility and the oxide is, I'll just comment here, of course, if you can use a process with material system that has a larger mobility, your speed's going to go up. But you as designers don't control that. And of course, if you use a thinner oxide, you get larger C ox and your speed's going to go up. But again, you don't have control over that. The only thing as designers you have control over is length and VGS. Does this make sense? Do you have an idea how to select length? and how to select overdrive. Okay, one more time one more thing before I'm going to leave. Sometimes you'll see this written as excess gate voltage. All right, so excess gate voltage. What does that mean? That's the VGS above the threshold. That's excess above the threshold. It's excess or excess to turn the device on. 
Well, that's how's that related to V overdrive? Same. How's it related to VDSSAT? Same. Confusing? Yes. Any questions? Yes? Because that's the oxide thickness. So you can't, unless you're designing the process, like when we design chips, that thickness is fixed. I can't. The only thing I can do is adjust the size of the device W and L in the in the, this direction. I can't actually adjust any of the thicknesses going down into the chip. Any other questions? Okay, so I want to answer next. How do I select all of these for maximum gain? Say I want a large gain. How do I select my biasing for big gain? Because this is one I had problems with when I started do doing design because it's counterintuitive. What's that? Yeah. It's going to be exact opposite because we're going to have a gain bandwidth where if you increase the speed, the gain's going to go down, or if you increase the gain, the speed's going to go down. Okay? Just like life. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bias my transistor like this. Let's just call this ID. And then I'm going to uh, apply. So I'm going to make this a little bit... Uh, real because I want to bias this up so I'm gonna put a current source here but of course this is an example where I gotta bias this so it accepts or precisely uh, drains out this ID the only way for me to do that is to diode connect this so I'm gonna put a big resistor here and what this means is big resistor means much much greater than the output resistance of the MOSFET so for DC, this is VDS, and this is VGS, which is equal to DC for what? Or to what? Yeah, okay. So let me ask. For DC, how much current flows in the capacitor for DC? You don't even need to think. Whenever someone asks, what's the DC current flowing in the capacitor, the answer is always zero. How much DC current flows into the gate? Okay, zero. Now I'm gonna. Uh, there's a little bit of a lie because in modern devices you get a little bit of gate current called gate tunnel current, that is undesirable. But again, these devices are so complicated that it is what it is. Okay, but you get no current. So if there's no place for current to flow in this resistor, this voltage and this voltage has to be the same because there's no current flowing through the resistor. Does everybody get that? Okay. What is the AC voltage there? VGS. How much AC current flows in this? This is another one of my favorite test questions. Zero. It's a DC current source. There's no AC current flowing in that. I can't change the current. The AC current's zero. Okay. So what do I, where does the current flow, Aaron? <laughs> where, no, where does this drain current flow? It flows in R out, which I'll draw external. Yay? So it's like, damn, I wish he wouldn't hand back homework and quizzes. He, now he knows my name. Yeah, I know everybody's name. Hey, 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 hey. All right. So what is this current then? Okay, ID. What is it? Okay, so what is this voltage here? Let's call this VDS. So what is VDS equal to? Let's see, what's the current that flows here? Oh, that's ID as well. Notice, I made it so the device is driving its own output resistance. So that says, okay, if it's the device and it's limited by itself, what is this device's output resistance? If I drive it itself, it's okay, the GM driving its own R out. So I got a current source, which means this output resistance is infinite or big. I got a big resistor here, say 20 meg, and the output resistance is 100k. And I'm asking, okay, if the transistor drives its own current, or its own source, then uh, what's the gain? So the current's flowing backwards through R out. So I write ID times R out, and then I write, okay, well. That's VDS is equal to minus 
GM VGS times R out, and I get, oh, VDS over VGS is equal to minus GM R out. Looking good? Okay, and this is the open circuit gain. Okay, and you say, okay, well, what can I learn with that? So I'm going to go take the magnitude, and we're going to, let's call this VDS over VGS. And I'm going to write this R out as 1 over lambda ID. Does everybody know how I went from R out to 1 over lambda ID? Okay, what is GM? Let's write it a little different because I got current here, right? So let's write it as square root of 2 kp w over l times id. Or let's just to make my first point here, we'll write it as 2 times mu n c ox w over l divided by lambda times the root of id. And so I ask you, Okay, so tell me what you can say about bias current here. If I want to have high gain, how do I select ID? Small. Well, wait, when I was learning and I was doing design, that didn't make sense to me. I need more gain, I want more ID. No, more gain less ID. So everybody follow that. So ID go up, gain go down. So I'm going to rewrite this another way and I'm going to put it as some constant. We'll call it C divided by square root of ID. Well, let's say proportional, but what's the square root of ID? That's the square root. ID was what? What's the square root of ID then? So if I pick VGS big, what happens to my gain? It goes down. So I look at that and I go, wait, VGS big speed go up, VGS big gain go down. So everybody follows. So if I ask, okay, for high speed, how do I, if I go back to my FT discussion, if I ask for high speed, how do I select FT? I'm sorry, for high speed, how do I select ID? Yeah, I want a big. Okay? I want big ID. If I want high gain, I want small ID. Does everybody see this? Because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to make a product called gain FT. I'm going to put them together, and then we're going to draw some conclusions. How do I increase both speed and gain? Okay, because that's something you might want to do. Oftentimes, people like to buy things with high gain and high speed, right? You don't want to buy a car that, uh, oh, I only want a car that accelerates really slow and doesn't go very fast. You want a car that accelerates fast and goes fast, right? <clears throat> you want your Tesla, right? <laughs> All right. Any questions on this result? Because we got to make a couple more comments. Okay, if I look just at this and I ask, just looking without knowing lambda is dependent on L, and I ask you, how does uh, L influence the speed or influence the gain? What would you say? Just looking at this alone. Now, I'm not going to cover this in too much detail. I will in a moment. When I put the two together, I'll cover a little more. But if I look at just this and I ask, if L gets smaller, what happens to my open circuit gain? Okay, that's what you would think, right? But remember, lambda is directly proportional to L. Okay, so I'm um, 1 over L, sorry. So lambda is proportional to 1 over L. So if I put that proportionality in there, I get a square root of L up here, and it ends up that if L gets bigger, the open circuit gain goes up. So let me pause, just go over that real quick. So I write here 
I write uh, that uh, gain is proportional to the square root of 1 over L, which is this term right here, divided by lambda, which is proportional to 1 over L. And I get this is equal to what? Square root of L. So I say, OK, if L goes up, what happens to the gain? It goes up as well. But it's harder to see in this equation. Because remember, if I have a bigger L, this is L right here, if L goes up and I modulate the thickness of the length of the channel, it has less influence on the drain current. Any questions? Because we're about to talk about GFT. You know what? Why don't I pause on that and let's go prove it. Let's go prove some of this stuff that I've been talking about. Okay? Let's go do that with simulations. Let's go here. Let's go to chapter 9. Let me pick one. Let's pick... Uh, um, what's 927? Let's modify this one. Now, oh, this is a 50 micron. Let's let's modify. Okay, let's use this one. Let's go get the scissors out. We won't have that. Let's uh, put let's put VDS here of uh, two volts, and then let's add a AC here of uh, one. Why do I like using one? Yeah, it's easy to divide by 1. I don't have to put in there V out over V in. Except I want to plot for FT. I want to plot what? ID over IG. So here, both the ID will be negative if I plot it through here. But I think I can get it in the MOSFET. So let's see. So I'm going to go change this to an AC. Decade. Multiply, divide by 10, 100 points per decade. Start frequency at 100 kilohertz. Stop frequency at 1 gig. Hit OK. Hit roll them. <coughs> Plot the current here. Plot the current here. <coughs> Do I expect my drain current to change? No? I'm just tucking it in my shirt. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to put divide by IG of M1. Boom. Now I'm going to get the scissors out. Select that. Go here. And I look at it, and let's go out just a little bit further. Let's start at uh, 1 meg. And notice it's not 1M. And I'll go to 10 gig. Hit OK. Hit Run. And then I'm going to hit Save for the sim. And I look at it, and since both currents are uh, going in, I'm not going to pay attention to the phase shift here. Does everybody, oops, does everybody understand what I'm doing? Does anybody understand what I'm doing? So I'm plotting the drain current divided by the gate current. You can't see it. And I look and I see my FT is roughly what? 800 megahertz. Okay, so let's, what was one of the conclusions I came to with uh, FT? Let's look and review. Yeah, what, I mean, I want to make my FT bigger. Tell me what to do. Decrease L or increase VGS? Let's mess with VGS first. So let's go, I'm going to do two VGSs. I'm going to change this to two. And let me see, what does that mean? Like a doubling or something? I'm going to hit run, and it goes from 800 to 
Um, one, two point five gigahertz. Does everybody see it went up? Now I'm going to go to three point five, and I want to pause for a moment, and I want to make everybody knows I'm making a mistake, right? Why? I hit run. Yeah. Does everybody see? Wait a sec. It went down. A, it didn't change much. It's now it's at 2.5. Still, it didn't really increase, even though I went from 2 to 1.5. Why? Triode. I've device uh, device and triode. Well, that's against what I said I was going to do. So if I go back and I say, okay, well, what happens if I go to point? Did everybody follow that? Okay. So I'm going to go back now, and let's say that I bias a device at point, oops, I bias, bias a device at 0 0.85, so it's just above the threshold voltage. Hit OK, and I go back and I say, okay, well now I'm operating, my FT is only 100 megahertz. So can anybody give me an example of CMOS circuits that you might regularly use that are biased with really small overdrive voltages or using power supply voltages that operate really slow because they don't have much overdrive? I mean, you could still, the device operates in sub-threshold. I mean, it still has a speed. Can you give me an example? Something I regularly use in this lecture? My calculator. The solar panel doesn't generate much power or voltage, right? But what's the operation of this calculator? What's the frequency? Well, hopefully it's about, if it's running great, it's 32 kilohertz. If it's running with an oscillator based upon the solar panel here, then it's going to run even slower. Okay, and it can because I don't have very much juice to power my CMOS. So everybody follow that. Okay, before we leave this, what was the other thing that we said influenced the speed besides overdrive? The length. So let's go put this back at uh, 1.5. And let's, uh, let's hit cancel and hit run. We go look, and our sim's rolling off, and we're at a uh, little, little bit less than 2 gig. Let's go change this to 1. And what did I say would happen to the FT? It would go up. Did it? Went way up. Went up to uh, about, what is that, 6, six gigahertz? Uh, but what if I go to, and now, does everybody understand that I could also spend your time saying, well, I increased L to 10, what happened to the current? Current went down. So then I go, okay, hit run, and then go look, and FT is about 70, 80 megahertz. Okay, so here's what not to do to me in two months. Don't say, um, but I don't know how to select L and W for speed and gain. How, where do I start? Because I'm going to be like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> if you're trying to design a circuit and it's the fastest, you got an op amp design and you got to design it to be as fast as possible, there's no deep thought. You got to use really small, minimum L and large VGS. Then your VGS is set by the how much output swing you need because you can't use too high because then it triodes and won't give you the right swing before it goes into nonlinear uh, triode region. Any questions on this? Okay, so let's talk about gain FT. Which is, how do I, it's a figure of merit, how do I increase the gain and the speed? What are my parameters? What can I adjust? No questions. So you're mean to tell me? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, if you can keep re. Uh, if you keep increasing VG, VDS, you can keep increasing VGS. The problem is now, 
keep in mind if you go get a job at Qualcomm or Broadcom or one of these places the modern devices as you start getting to real high electric fields they don't behave like these equations and so you don't see the same bang for the buck but the problem is if I go and I put VDS across my device unless it's like narrow band radio circuit where I've got a inductor peaking circuit in there or something like that you don't get any output swing so the circuits pretty useless you can't vary the voltage on the drain before the device triode so it's really not that useful of a device right so you can't just go all the way up to VDS of 5 volts or whatever it is and VGS of 4 or 5 and then so I'm gonna have maximum gain okay so let me just pause for a moment if you take in the digital class then that might pop into your mind oh that's why the digital gates are so fast when we put a signal in the gate we're going zero to VDD the outputs are swinging zero to VDD everything's at the maximum speed that's why I can get a nanosecond or less than a nanosecond prop delay in a gate because I'm operating with full overdrive as high as it can go does everybody follow that okay so let's talk about gain FT any other questions so this is on page, I guess we're not getting to uh, temperature. Um, this is on page uh, 300, if you want to follow along. Not that I'll copy what's in the book. Um, so gain FT product. All right, so I'm going to write my gain now as uh, GMR out and my FT as uh, GM. Let's put this as GFT. And did I put it as, yeah. All right, so it's GM over 2 pi times uh, CGS. All right, does everybody agree with that? Does anybody agree with that? All right, so I'm going to go right now that that's gm squared all over lambda id times 2 pi times 2 thirds times c ox prime times w times l. And then why don't I go ahead and write this as what is gm squared equal to? And what's another name for KP times W over L? Beta times ID. <coughs> Looking good? All right. So then I can write GFT is equal to the IDs cancel 2 times mu N C ox prime times W over L divide by lambda times 2 pi times 2 thirds C ox prime times W over L. So, oh, whoops, yeah, thank you. I was getting ahead of myself. I was thinking of uh, uh, how it flips up and or flips down becomes L squared. All right, so what can I cancel? W's? Oh, wait, so if I increase the width of the device, what happens to R out? Okay, if I increase the channel, if I increase the size, the diameter of the pipe supplying water, what happens to the resistance to supply water? goes down. So if I increase the width of my device, what happens to its R out? goes down. But what happens to its transconductance? It goes up. Does everybody follow that? Okay, so those cancel. So the key takeaway is width doesn't influence. If I'm trying to increase gain and speed, width again has no influence. Seox prime drops up, but the mu n doesn't. That's again a material parameter. 
that I can control or that I can't control that's from the process. So if I were to go to a uh, silicon germanium uh, type semiconductor and that increase in mobility, I could get an increase in speed that's inherent that's I get in my circuit without me doing any special design tricks. Does everybody follow that? Okay, so I basically pick the pro I get a process that I have to use. I have to design within the parameters of the process. I don't get to adjust the process parameters because those are material things. It's like me going to Home Depot and I want to build a wall in my house and I go to get two by fours and I go, mm, yeah, I don't really like two by fours. I want to use two by fives. Well, I can't buy a two by five there. Now you could argue, okay, you could get a two by six and cut it or whatever. Okay, well, I mean, but I. That would mean I have some control over what I'm building with, right? But you get the idea. All right, so then I look at this and I go, okay, so what parameter, if I want to increase gain FT, the gain bandwidth product? Oh, and speaking of that, in uh, to this week's lab, um, I went for the 420L. I don't know if anybody noticed this. But uh, I want to make sure that you do a good job in this lab and you go through. So I increased the due date or I delayed the due date to February 20th. So the next two labs will be one-weekers, but this one will be a two-week because I want you really to understand the trade-offs here and do a good job on this lab. And I want you rushing through it. Okay. So this stuff, gain bandwidth product, is exactly um, what we talk about in this lab here. So speed, uh, -na. Whoop, maybe it wasn't this lab. Um, finite, oh no, it's in lab four, the one that's after this. Uh, right, gain bandwidth product, lab four. Okay, so I want, in any case, I want you to be able to get those op amp problems backwards and forwards because when you design an op amp, I don't want you to design an op amp but then not know how to analyze the circuit it's used in. Okay, and if you didn't take my lab, you're missing it. You're missing something. You're welcome to watch those. You guys are missing my lab, aren't you? <laughs> All right. So, if I ask how does L influence, if I increase... The, uh, so pause for a moment. If I want to increase the gain bandwidth product, does changing L influence the gain bandwidth product? Yes. Okay, so I want you to think. This is kind of a trick question. If I change L, how did that change my speed? If I decrease L, the speed goes up linearly, right? Okay, so kudos for anybody that can answer this next question. If I want to increase my open circuit gain, how does changing the length influence the open circuit gain? Square root. Okay, so this is in the numerator, square root. And for the speed, it's 1 over L. Uh, whoops, where was speed? One over is one over L, okay? One over L squared, if you want to be precise. So even though I say that increasing or decreasing the L increases the gain bandwidth product, I still know that it reduces the gain, but it increases the speed. But the gain reduction is faster than the speed reduction, and so I get an overall increase in the gain bandwidth product. So let me repeat myself. So I'm sitting there and I'm designing in my cubicle and I ask, okay, I got this process. I want to increase the gain and the speed of the op amp, the gain bandwidth product or whatever circuit you're designing. I have basically one parameter that I can adjust and that's L. Okay. If I change the L, does it get me an increase in gain? If I reduce the L, does it give me an increase in gain? No. My gain goes down. If I reduce the L, does it give me an increase in speed? Yes. The speed increase is faster than the gain increase, and so I get an overall increase in the gain FT product. The key takeaway is that changing the length, even though gain FT product goes up, doesn't cause the gain to go up. Does everybody follow that? 
because that can be kind of frustrating. But he said, if I change the L, GFT goes up. It does go up, but the gain still goes down. It just goes down faster than the bandwidth increases. Any questions? Okay, last thing. I look at this and I go, okay, um, how does uh, the, uh, okay, so I know if I look at this, then the GFT, just to be complete, is proportional to mu n over L. I don't have, if I'm assuming it, if we use a short channel process, it's uh, not linearly dependent on L. If it was long channel, you could go L squared here. Um, I'm assuming I don't have control over adjusting the mobility. So I only have control over L. That's my key takeaway. How does inf changing the overdrive voltage, VGS minus V threshold N, influence the gain bandwidth product? It doesn't. And that's a key point. I'm messing with my VGS and I'm not getting my op-amp UV gain or my inherent transistor speeds to change. My speed changes, but my overall gain bandwidth product doesn't. This is, I've done it personally. I've chased my tail for weeks. Why can't I get it? My gain goes up, my speed goes down, my speed goes up, my gain goes down. Because I didn't know this fundamental topic here of how, what I'm influencing in the L. I changed the VGS. VGS goes up, speed goes up. VGS goes up, gain goes down. I changed the bias current. Bias current goes up, everything else being the same. Speed goes down. Product stays the same. Only thing to increase gain bandwidth product is L. But again... That doesn't, if I de use the minimum L or I reduce L, my gain goes down, my speed goes up, just not linearly, just not proportionally the same amount. Did I cover that well enough? Okay, we got five, less than five minutes. I want to real briefly introduce you to one other topic, just so you have it, and we'll uh, talk about it more on Monday. Because all we're going to do on Friday is work problems. So everybody knows I got all my problems, my homework worked or wherever you're having issues. Does this make sense? So don't ask later. I don't know how to select WL and VGS. There is no one answer. There's only trade-offs. That's the thing. It's like, I'm going to paint a picture. I'm going to paint a picture of this building. Okay, well, there's not just one way to paint that picture. There's a million ways, right? This is the art of doing design and creating things. Okay, I know students know. Tell me what the input is. I'll calculate and I'll get the output. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, last topic, real briefly. You may remember from microelectronics, come on, thermal voltage. And that's VT, and that's KT over Q. So if I, and T is in what degree, what units? Kelvin. So if T goes up, what happens to VT? It goes up. All right, threshold voltage. Threshold voltage is oftentimes written as VT. I like to write it as V threshold N, or some people like to say V thevenin. No, it's V threshold N. Okay, here's the thing. If T goes up with the threshold voltage, what happens to the threshold voltage? it gets smaller. So I had a student go for a job interview at a company in San Jose. And the, he was actually interviewed by the CEO. And uh, so there's a lot of startups there. And he was asked the question, how does VT change with temperature? Okay, he thought that that person was asking him about the threshold voltage. And he answered, no, thresh, if VT goes down with increasing temperature. But the guy was actually asking him about the thermal voltage. And he says, oh, you don't know anything. VT goes up with increasing temperature. You have to be very clear when you're answering that question what you're talking about. So now, if I go, does everybody understand? So when you answer questions, make sure you're answering the question you think you're answering and not the, which, they may not be asking what you're understanding. So if I look at threshold voltage, for example, 
Here's at 100 degrees plotting drain current, and there's zero, at zero degrees. So if I put my cell phone in the dash of my car and I park it in a parking lot in the sun in Las Vegas, what's going to happen to all the threshold voltages on the billions and billions of MOSFETs in that phone? They're going to start dropping, right? Well, if I've got my circuitry and it's off, well, it's not really off because even when I'm below the threshold voltage, I get a leakage current. But what happens to that leakage current? It starts going up. What happens to your draw on your battery? It starts getting bigger. And all of a sudden, your battery, hopefully nowadays they have sensors that shut off, but your battery starts getting drained down because all those transistors are leaking more. Okay? So you need to remember, if th temperature goes up, threshold voltage goes down, transistors leak more, I get more power dissipation. Does everybody follow? So now you know how to explain it to your loved ones, why your battery drains more when your phone gets hot. Okay? Just tell them the threshold voltage. And they don't get it. Say it's like, well, you know, you turn your hose on. Start getting it. <laughs> All right? Yeah, the hose bib. You don't know what a hose bib is? Come on. No, don't say that. <laughs> All right. Any last second questions? All right, I'll see some of you Friday morning. I'll see others of you Friday afternoon or both. Have a good day.